Till I come, he says, give attendance to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. And I'm kind of skipping the uh, 13th verse there. So meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, to the doctrine continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Well, remember, he's giving this to young Timothy, so uh, it's great advice, uh, and it's advice that, uh, well, we'd have to say that most of his life he was heeding this advice anyway. I mean, what a wonderful thing it is to be raised up to know the Lord and to know the Word of God. And young Timothy had godly mother and a godly grandmother. Oh, what influences they were, indeed. With, uh, we don't know. You say, what happened to his father? Well, his father was uh, a pagan. So uh, Eunice had married a pagan. So um, we assume that he wasn't saved. But we'll, we don't know the whole story on this. But we do know that this was the great influence. So when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, I first dwelt in thy mother, grandmother Lois. And she obviously led Eunice, her daughter, to the Lord. And uh, thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. And that from a child, he says in 2 Timothy 3, we'll get to this at some point, uh, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee, there it is, wise unto salvation. Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, uh, ah, that was a unique advantage. Children that are raised to know Jesus. What a wonderful advantage that is. What a necessity that is at this juncture. We can't, uh, you know, the devil gets them the rest of the week and influences them with the godless uh, uh, people of the world, teachers, uh, media. Uh, it's all, you know, it's godless stuff out there. So uh, train them up in the way that they should go. You know, in these days, of course, they didn't have public schools. So uh, it was all, everybody was homeschooled at that point. So, and uh, got the best training in the word of God that you could get. He knew the holy scriptures from youth. So what an advantage that is. And so uh, while we're here, the young people are studying and they're learning their parts in the, uh, wonderful way they can uh, and by the way the parents go right along with it right you all memorize along with the children as you help them uh, through their paces so uh, hopefully that's what's going on all right so let's take a look a little closer look here at the at the power of reading and understanding and getting the word in your heart Psalm 119 has uh, wherewithal shall he it's a rhetorical question wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way well we already know the answer to that don't we by taking heed thereto to thy word. Thy word, have I, well, with thy whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. And then it says, thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So you put it here, and you know it, and you read it, and you study it. And so it um, makes all the difference in the world. Now later when we get to 2 Timothy, we'll have the same kind of advice here. So there's somewhat of this reiteration that occurs with thought, and the thought is that valuable, it's that important. Study to show thyself approved unto God, workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Boy, what does this mean? Well, here's where doctrine comes into it, right? Because uh, just reading the Bible without really understanding how it fits together and to see how it uh, uh, arranges the various doctrinal truths uh, it can be dangerous. And that's what we have. We have a lot of cults today that emphasize one verse over and against another one and so on. And this is how we end up with uh, heresy. But you can see here, this is the uh, biblical uh, mandate, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, we'll get to some of that in, here in just a bit. Now, it was Jesus that said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Well, let's remember, we're still on the cusp of the day of uh, the Holy Spirit indwelling people. Oh, the Spirit would come and go, but not live inside. What a difference that is. Now, we have a teacher that dwells within us, and as uh, the epistle in John says, you need not that any man teach you. Now, you have the Holy Spirit, the unction, the anointing. So, uh, so he speaks of this here, and he says, uh, I have many things to tell you, but I can't tell them to you now. You know, there's, some, there's a lesson we can extrapolate from this, and so on. Uh, believers have to grow. Uh, in their maturity. Different people at different levels and so on. So uh, it, it certainly, uh, it takes mature believers to understand the deeper things of God. And Jesus indicates it here. You cannot bear them now. They're, they were still just juniors. They, they had a lot to learn at this point. And they didn't have the indwelling spirit yet. So that would make a difference. Howbeit, he says, when the spirit of truth 
is come, and that's one of the many appellations for the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of truth, isn't he? Uh, when the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Oh, listen, so we have the infallible guide of God's Spirit living within the heart. And uh, as a result, we have the parameters kind of set for us, and the Holy Spirit will guide and lead us into truth. We have to pray for his power in doing it. Now, I kind of... Uh, I left that 14th verse out uh, in between because the two thoughts, are, uh, they're somewhat disjointed. But um, let's take it up here uh, for now. And we'll get back to the idea of doctrine. But it kind of returns to that, you know, about saving yourself and saving those that hear you. So uh, let's look at that 14th verse. So neglect not that gift that is in thee, which uh, was given thee in prophecy by the laying on of hands, the hands of the presbytery. So... The, uh, what does, it's kind of a strange expression, so uh, we want to kind of get into this a bit. So uh, the gift, of course, that he's talking about, uh, well, you know, there are many gifts. The Holy Spirit brings many gifts. Some were temporary and some were permanent. And certainly one of the permanent gifts in the church for 2,000 years has been the gift to teach. And I think that's what Paul has in mind in particular here because that's what the context is telling us. Not speaking about the gift of healing here, which I think was rather temporary and certainly a sign gift. Um, he wasn't teaching, he wasn't uh, certainly teaching about the uh, gift of uh, foreknowledge, which John had on the Isle of Patmos, which seemed to end all that gift because now uh, prophecies shall fail, whether their tongues they shall cease, whether they be knowledge it shall vanish away. So the, there were temporary sign gifts given in the transitional period. But once the word had been given now, we have now the corpus of God's doctrine. Now we have everything we need. And we have the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us. So there's, there's uh, the temporary gifts and sign gifts were uh, just for transition. So here I think he's speaking the gift uh, that he's just laid out before us, the gift of teaching, right? So he's talking about reading, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, so the, this is all about the teaching ministry and aspect of it. And this apparently, young Timothy uh, exhibited gifts already in that direction. Again, he was raised up uh, by godly grandmother and mother and so on, so he knew the scriptures. Uh, so that's a grand advantage right there. That doesn't mean there's a call to the ministry just because uh, a child knows the Bible. It has to go further than that, and that was recognized in him. So here uh, we have the... Uh, the what the symbolic impartation of the spirit by laying on of hands i say symbolic at this point hands can't transfer the holy ghost into somebody so what is this about other than a symbolic act and so and we've repeated it now for centuries of time in the ordination of gospel ministers uh, uh, elders will lay their hands upon the head of the minister they will have recognized in the minister requisite gifts that would qualify them to become ministers of the gospel. Now you can go to seminary, but they don't, they don't ordain anybody at a seminary. Uh, that's for teaching, certainly, but ordination is the local church. The local church, as you see here, gathered around Timothy, and they, they said, this man has the gifts, this, this man has the ability, he uh, has the desire. So that, uh, that was recognized. So that's when it says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy. So the, in other words, the prophecy here, foretelling, you could say, um, predictive, maybe not in some divine sense, but at the same sense that we could maybe look today at a young man that's showing great promise. And we say in him, you know, we can see something there, the power of the Holy Spirit, the zeal of the Lord, uh, an acquisition of knowledge. Maybe he's still learning, but he... He has uh, the desire to learn. He's, a, he's a scholastic and uh, demonstrates those disciplines. So if, that, if that's the case, then you set them apart for ministry. You recognize it. Uh, and, and in that sense, the prophecy isn't really a divine prophecy. It's, it's recognizable. It's something that you could see that was in him. And, uh, and so uh, when they ordain him, the, the, the prophecy is that you would, uh, you would do well, that you would go out, and that you would preach the gospel to the four corners of the earth, and so on. <laughs> now, I, I know there are a lot of ministers that have been ordained, and they have proven unfaithful, 
And uh, some of them still continue to minister, but they should be thrown out of the ministry. But uh, we don't have people doing that much anymore. But that, that ought to be the case. Uh, you know, you may, he may have had the qualifications in the beginning, but uh, he's now unqualified. So if that's the case, then he has to be jettisoned out of the ministry and uh, put out. So, uh, so at which point then they would lay their hands upon him. And this is the presbytery that's saying here. So remember, we have those two offices, you know, episcopus and presbyterus and the idea of elders. They were elders. They recognized the gifts uh, that this young Timothy had and uh, that he should be ordained to preach the gospel. So in a sense, we have here, uh, we only have two ordinances. So we have communion, we have baptism. But what is this, ordination? Uh, well, we might say that's kind of a lesser ordinance in a sense, right? So it's the power of the church to set ministers out uh, into the gospel field. Uh, so maybe another word we can have on this. So this charge, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So we see this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we discussed it when we were there to some degree. Uh, and so now it's kind of reiterated here in the fourth chapter. Uh, and now telling us about this actual ceremony that they had and setting them apart and demonstrating the need for the Holy Spirit to guide and lead. And thus the transference, again, was symbolic. The presbytery, the elders of the church are now saying, come down upon this man and bring your power upon his head, as it were. So that's what the laying on of hands is all about. Now you're going to see this, of course, as an Old Testament concept. And in fact, it's something that uh, in Hebrews, uh, it seems as though... It, it, uh, we were to leave off from those Old Testament concepts. At any rate, he says here in Genesis 48, so Joseph took them both. Now he's got his grandsons. Uh, or he has his sons and, his, uh, and, uh, and uh, Jacob is about to bless his grandsons, right? Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near unto him and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So what was this all about? Well, you know, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So it was a conference, a symbolic conference of inheritance. Uh, and that's why it was vitally important. But remember that Jacob himself, you know, he, 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 was, uh, he was the usurper. He wasn't firstborn. So there's a sense when it says wittingly, he knew what he was doing, in other words. Uh, uh, though he was somewhat blinded and so, uh, but he knew what he was doing and he, he guided his hands wittingly. So he knew uh, that the, this is where he wanted the inheritance to go. And then if you see how the uh, lot came later, that's uh, through the lands uh, that Joshua partitioned off. Uh, Ephraim and uh, Manasseh, the uh, land difference, the variance is quite... Uh, pronounced as a matter of fact all right so so it was used there in conference of inheritance and uh, in numbers 810 we have now here uh, thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites now it's a symbol of ordaining priests so in a sense now we're carrying that over into the New Testament uh, so they would take the Levites in the, same, in the same fashion. Now again, they weren't conferring the Holy Spirit upon the Levites. It was just a symbol. The symbol was that God's power, that God would from heaven lay his hands upon these Levites, sanctify them, and use them in the service of sacrifice to the Lord. Uh, so again, we have another case here in Leviticus 1.4, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. And it shall be acceptable for him to make atonement for him. Now, in this case, of course, he's not putting his hand on a person's head. He's actually using the sacrifice. Here, again, is a symbol of transferring sin to the substitute. Uh, they would do this with uh, the goat as well. Remember, there were two goats that would be taken, and one would escape, and the other one would be the sacrificial goat, and its blood would be shed. The other one was set free into the wilderness. All of this... A high symbolism in what Christ would accomplish as the lamb that would take the blow on the cross and you and I would escape the judgments of God. That's how it would work. 
So again, the concept of transferring. Uh, the priest didn't have the sins of the people in his hands. It was symbolic. He was representing the people as a high priest. He would take their sins on the Day of Atonement and he would transfer them. Of course, he would go through hand washing and ceremonial cleansing and uh, would sprinkle the blood and then he would take the sacrifice, you know, and the sacrifice then, it would uh, be given his hands transferring the sin of the people to the lamb or the ox or whatever was brought at that juncture. Deuteronomy 34. So we have Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So uh, here again, the Joshua you know, is full, full of the spirit of wisdom at this point. And Moses had laid his hands upon him. And uh, you see, he had already really had the requisite gifts to be the captain of the Lord's hosts in the, in the physical sense. And Moses saw him as being the, uh, the leader that would take the place. Same with what Paul is doing, essentially, saying, now, Timothy, I'm leaving. I'm going to depart, you know, and be with the Lord, and you're going to take, take it from here. And so we have this kind of successive concept of passing authority on symbolically. So it was just a symbol, again, of transferring authority. Then in the New Testament, you have a case where, uh, and he could there do no mighty works save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. This is Jesus, and uh, now we have, again, the symbol of transferring of healing power. Now, he didn't, do, he didn't do this every time he healed somebody. There are times that he did, and I think he did this intentionally to demonstrate, again, remember his role is the last Adam. He's coming here, and he's going to, uh, he's going to do what the first Adam failed, and he's going to obey God in all things, and he's going to be uh, as a man would be and ought to be which means dependent upon God. And the notion here is the hand of God would work through Jesus. So symbolically, he lays his hands upon. But uh, the power was from God. And he didn't always use that. There were other means that he used to heal people. Sometimes he just spoke a word and they were healed. So uh, the necessity of laying on of hands. What happens when we read things like this is we automatically think, oh, there's some, there's some magic formula. We've got to make sure we have it just you know, in a certain order. And this is what happens with the high church people is that they have an order to service and they have it has to be done this way. These words have to be uttered in a certain way. If you're a Roman Catholic priest, you have to genuflect so many times. But when you walk past the cross, you must bless yourself. Uh, when the bell rings, you have to mea culpa, mea culpa, you know, mea maxima culpa. So everything had to be done by order and... and and all it becomes then is a perfunctory service of ritual when it, it means nothing after a while. Uh, so that's why we don't always see a consistency in the laying on of hands or any of these other acts. They're just symbolic. Uh, all right. We also see here in Matthew chapter 19 that they were brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them. So what was he doing here? So he's putting his hands on them. Well, I think in this case, you know, he's just taking them up in his arms. Uh, but the Bible, you know, is clear to tell us so he put his hands upon them. So we would think, what, is he blessing them in some fashion? Is it, is it necessary? Can the Lord bless without putting his hands on? Can you be blessed without having your head, you know, somebody putting their hand on your head and so on? Do we have to do it in a prescribed manner? And uh, the answer to all of that is, no, the, the Lord wants us to act in spirit and in truth. So a uh, symbol of transfer of the blessings in this case that's all that would mean then we see it in Acts 8 17 then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost now this is an interesting uh, juncture at this point uh, eight, uh, Acts chapter 8 so we're in the infancy of the church and uh, uh, to this point now in Acts chapter 8 uh, the idea of uh, conferring the spirit upon Samaritans so up to this point uh, Pentecost uh, those that heard the word were saved. The spirit fell upon them. Nobody laid their hands on them. They, the spirit was there. Then they were born again. In this case, though, symbolically, something is changing. Jesus said, uh, before he leaves earth, he gives the final instruction there in the book of Acts. He says, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea 
and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So it seems to me perhaps, you know, something vitally different is happening at this juncture. And so uh, there's a, sy a symbol that accompanies it, and that is the laying on of hands. Now again, the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 10 at the house of uh, Cornelius f fell upon all that heard the word. Cornelius, you know, and all of them were, uh, were listening and believing the word. And as they were believing it, the Spirit came upon them. So there's really, again, there's no uh, formula. There's, there's nothing that we have to do to make it happen. And uh, there in Acts chapter 13, and when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Now this had to do, again, with the ordination of ministers that we're seeing, I think, in our text right now. All right. So, in 1 Timothy 4.16, it says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Uh, so they're vitally important. So what's this passage mean? Well, first of all, it says, take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine and continue in them. So the idea of uh, a doctrine, so vitally important and right from the inception of the church, there's a great emphasis on this in the formation of what we'd have to consider the first New Testament church, which happens at Pentecost. And in Acts chapter 2, you'll find, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Uh, but notice again, he says, continue in them for in doing this. So uh, the doctrine, continue in this. Uh, I think I have it. There it is in Acts. Okay, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So this, this was something that they would do in uh, uh, perpetuity. And on through the centuries of time, for that matter. The Apostles' Doctrine. So we certainly want to know, well, what's the Apostles' Doctrine? Uh, in the 4th century, there was, uh, there was great confusion. You had the Gnostics now. And the Gnostics were uh, bringing their, uh, their tainted doctrines. Uh, acknowledging Christ, but a different Christ. And another Christ. And this Paul warns about vociferously in the Second Corinthians, the last chapter, and then Galatians chapter 1. They bring another Christ and another gospel. And uh, it became very confusing. And the people were saying, well, Jesus was just, he was just a man, but you know, the Spirit came upon him at, at times. And, and they, they, they had all these various and nuances of differences about Christ. And everything was about the fact that they didn't believe that Jesus was actually God. And it all came down to that. By the fourth century, there, there was great cont contention about this. And that's when Athanasius and, uh, you know, the Athanasian Creed, later called the Apostles' Creed. And the notion of that creed was to set forth a systematic order of doctrinal truth that believers say are fundamental truths. So I believe in one God, the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, and the rest of that Athanasian Creed, and then later the Nicene Creed, and then later called the Apostles' Creed. There's nothing wrong with any of the words in there. And people say, well, it says there, there's one holy Catholic church. Yeah, small c. And uh, so you have to find out what the word c means. Catholic, you know, with a small c means universal. And the church of Jesus Christ is wherever a person is born again. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. So uh, that's what Catholic means. Uh, but when you put a, a capital C and you put a Roman Catholic, or you put a capital C and a Ukrainian Catholic, or you put a capital C and a Russian Orthodox Catholic, or a capital C and Greek Catholic, and on and on it goes, then we've got a denomination. Uh, we're making a denomination out of the word. And that's not what Athanasius meant, and certainly uh, wasn't the recitation of that creed for that reason. At any rate, that was the Apostles' doctrine. Uh, so vitally important. He said, continue in these things, and throughout the scriptures, it's all about continuing. Uh, in 1 John, there were apostates. They were with us, and now they're not of us. So what was this about? Well, again, there are people that uh, believe for a while and, and follow along, so to speak, but their heart really isn't there. And they went out from us, but they were not of us. So John here has the discernment. If they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Uh, so... Uh, why the importance and why is this emphasized? Not just by Paul, but now John is emphasizing it as well. And uh, it's vitally important. And it's, uh, it, it's significantly important because the notion is that we've got to 
continue in that corpus of truth. So, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, now uh, Paul likes to use this word saved, and it's a good word. I love the word saved. But it has different connotations depending on the context. So, uh, so what does it mean in this context when he says, well, uh, if you continue in this, you shall save yourself and them that hear thee. Well, he already knows that Timothy's saved. He, he, he speaks of that early in the epistle. Uh, he speaks of him as his son in the faith. So he certainly can't mean that you'll be saved by continuing, you know. And uh, people that like to believe that you can lose your salvation point to a verse like this. And they'll say, aha, you see, uh, you've got to continue. You've got to keep doing it. If you don't keep doing it, then you're not saved. I would say if you don't keep doing it, you probably never were saved. What believer would turn his back on Christ? What true believer, I mean, I should say. We've got to qualify that. Let's not forget that there were 12 apostles and one of them was a devil. It appeared as though he was a, an apostle, but he really wasn't. He was a devil right from the beginning. So uh, there are people that insinuate themselves into the body politic of the church. I think they're agents of Satan in some cases, really. They come to so discord and, and create problems and uh, all sorts of things and ra raise issues and, and divide churches and this happens all the time and uh, were they really of us you know in a sense uh, it depends on you know what was their doctrine what did they really believe and in some cases you'll find out later on in life that they you know they're not following this at all anymore so if it, it must be that when he says saved here he's not talking about you could lose your salvation he's talking here in a different context and so the saved here has to do with, you know, all of us have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You will, I will, all of us give an account. And so what are we going to do when we stand before God? Well, we, we're going to be saved, it says, yet so is by fire, 1 Corinthians 3 and 10, 11, 12, and so on. The idea here is, though, what about our works? Because our works will be burned up if they're, if they're, if they're of a, um, a deficient quality, let's put it that way. So wood, hay, and stubble is the category. If, if that's the kind of work we're doing, well, those works won't be saved, that's for sure. They'll be burned up. If I become somehow uh, you know, entangled with false doctrine, these Mormons are slick characters, you know. And there are people that uh, end up listening to the Mormons, and they say, well, you know, maybe Jesus did appear to the Indians. You know, maybe he did come 1,800 years after the, <laughs> you know, appears with an angel and gives you another couple books and so on. And uh, so they follow false doctrine. So they're, they're not rooted and grounded. They, they don't really understand what the truth is. Amen. And, uh, and so they're, they're, they're led astray. Uh, so, but it does say, I think in the same breath, he uses the word saved in two different contexts. For Timothy, he wouldn't be saving himself or keeping himself saved by preaching. He's already saved, sealed by the Holy Spirit. But he'll save those that hear him. Now, that could mean two things as well. Believers that already are following and listening to his doctrine, they'll be saved from the Bema Seed judgment because they're going to follow and, and do what the young preacher is teaching them. But he might also mean the unsaved that hear him. In this case, now he's talking about saved from hell. Saved from hell is also vitally important for us. And so, uh, as he preaches the gospel, there'll be those that hear it and believe it, those that hear it and reject it. And uh, if, if they follow on to know the Lord, you know, it says in Hosea, if you follow on to know the Lord. Uh, so, uh, there's more to it than just say, oh yeah, I believe that. You know, it, it's got to go a little deeper than that, I'm sorry. So, saved, it's a wonderful word, I love the word and so on. So, uh, it's, it's a good way of describing, when people say they're Christians, uh, you want to know if they're saved. And there it is, the word is sozo. And so again, it's a generic word. It has a lot to, do, to preserve one who is in danger of destruction or to save or rescue. So it can, it can mean, depending on the, the context, certainly hell fire. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's certainly uh, salvation from hell. Uh, Jude says, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. And Peter speaks of it. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If the righteous scarcely be saved, that's quite a bit of an indictment there. So what do we have here? Well, we have these gradations. 
You have people that are totally dedicated, love the Lord, they follow Christ with all their heart, right? And they're serving God, they're doing what they can. They expect, as John says, to receive a full reward when they get to heaven. There are others that are kind of falling away from that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're not really on fire. They're not uh, doing God's service in any fashion. And uh, their work might be burned up as a result of that. Yet they'll be saved, it says in 1 Corinthians. So uh, in this case, Peter says, well, they're just scarcely saved. Scarcely saved. Well, what, what could that mean? Well, again, there's gradations of all of this. Now, how close do you want to get to this line, right? There's a line somewhere between saved and lost. It's a definite line. You're either saved or you're lost. You're the sheep or you're the goat, right? You're the good fish or you're the bad fish. You're the wheat or you're the tares. So there's a line there somewhere. Now, that's undetectable to me and to you. Remember in Matthew 13, the instruction to the angel is to, when you take the harvest, you got to... You won't know the difference between the wheat and the tares. So you'll have to leave it till the end. And let the, the angels of the Lord are going to come. They'll separate the wheat from the tares. They know the difference. So uh, I certainly don't want to be in the category scarcely saved. Just saved by the skin of your teeth. There are a lot of people that they'll say, well, you know, uh, you know, I'm just glad to go to heaven. I don't need any rewards. That's the way they look at it, right? I'm just glad I, you know, just to just barely get in and so forth. That's the way it is. Uh, it's immature believers, perhaps. Scarcely saved. Just kind of with one toe over the line, you know. Um, I don't want to be categorized as scarcely saved. Is not this a brand plucked out of the burning? Well, Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. And that's the case for the believer that really recognizes, you know, you were, you were 10 inches from burning in hell. Uh, the word saved then means so much to us. And we, we take that word, you know, and we delight in it. Saved. And we understand what it means. You know, so so means to be rescued, you know, plucked like at the last minute. Uh, and and, and you're, you're in the miry clay quicksand and you're sinking. And you're about to die when the, the arm of the Lord comes and plucks you up. I don't think anybody should read Edgar Poe, Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, he's a bit macabre. That said, I mean, if you've uh, studied in literature or whatever, then you had to read uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Well, he has this, uh, he has this, uh, these short stories that he wrote. Everybody familiar with Edgar Allan Poe? I don't have to explain this, right? <clears throat> but he had one called Pit and the Pendulum. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> Pit and the Pendulum? Well, the movie, you know, I mean, <laughs> they make up things. But Edgar Allan Poe's story, it's, it's intriguing because there's a sense in which this, you know, it's during the French Inquisition and the Roman Catholics had, had uh, gotten this uh, captain and uh, he was a Christian and they were persecuting him and they put him in, uh, on, the, on the pit, on the pendulum first. You know, the pendulum was back and forth, back and forth, getting lower and lower and lower, cutting the ropes, you know, and so forth. And uh, he somehow escapes. Uh, mice came in and, and ate the uh, ropes and he was able to escape. Uh, but, uh, so he falls then into the pit. And the pit is a, uh, the, the, it's a room that has a floor in it. And the floor begins uh, receding. And, and underneath, of course, is a fiery pit. And you're about to fall into it. And little by little. Uh, now this is all because Edgar Allan Poe basically is exposing what the Inquis Inquisition was all about slow torture, making people confess to being heretics and uh, 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 forcing them to do obeisance to the Pope and, and, you know, uh, and renounce what they once believed and renounce the Bible, so to speak, at any rate. So the walls continue to, uh, the floor continues to recede into the walls and, you know, it's, he only has now inches and, you know, he's, he's holding himself against the wall and now the floor is opening and opening. And just at the last minute, uh, the soldiers of liberation have come over the, uh, over the walls and they grab hold of him just as he's about to fall into the pit and they plucked him to safety. That's what it is when Jesus saved us. <laughs> Right at the last moment, you might say, he saved us his brands from the burning out of the miry clay. 
and set our feet upon a rock and he established our goings and put a new song in our mouth and all the rest that goes along with salvation. I love the word saved, don't you? Yes. Now we have this, you know, illustration. Uh, so it was Katrina. Uh, now, first of all, there's something wrong with your head. If you live in a city that you walk down the street, as you're walking down the street above you, you can see ocean vessels. There's something wrong with you if you're going to live in a city like that. I mean, uh, you know, it's below sea level. But they said, well, we have sacks of flour that'll keep the, you know, <laughs> this isn't idiotic, but this is where we are. And Katrina came, you know, they blamed it on George Bush. I guess he did it intentionally, but I mean, it's idiotic what people say. The mayor there had all these buses available, wouldn't use any to, to bus people out of there. Uh, but it was blamed on, you know, the Republicans did this. But uh, it's crazy. At any rate, People stayed. They stayed where they were. And a lot of people do this all the time. You remember Harry Truman? Not the president, but Harry Truman was living in a log cabin on Mount St. Helens. When, when did that explode? In the late 70s, early 80s? Mount St. Helens. Do you remember that? And uh, they said, it's going to blow its top. Gotta, everybody got to get out. Everybody's got to get out and so forth. Not Harry Truman. No. You know, he's going to ride it out. You know, he's Pecos Bill or whatever, you know. <laughs> These people. And... Uh, he burned up. You know that was the end. they couldn't even find him. You know that nothing left after the you know after lava comes down and magma. You know uh, there's nothing left of your bones. It, you know you burned up. At any rate, in Katrina, this is what you see what they were doing. They they wrote uh, the, save us. They they climbed out on their roof and they hoped that someone would come for their. And sure enough, the Coast Guard sends out life-saving lifelines, right? And uh, Coast Guard people went down on the roof and plucked these people up and brought them to safety. And I think this is what a great illustration of what salvation is. And so if we preach the gospel and mean it with all of our heart, we'll save some, won't we? We'll be able to save some. Do what this guy, you know, look at him. He's come down, he's plucking people off the roof and bringing them up to safety. That's what Jesus did. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will save you by his blood out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your savior wants to be. Be saved today. All right, so. Well, there, the greatest question that was ever asked and the greatest answer that was ever given is when the jailer came in and sprang in and trembling and he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, Hey, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, well, you've got to join the church and tithe. <laughs> you <know? laughs> Can you believe that? No, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So it's wonderful. And perhaps it's, it's so simply stated that it's understated. Because people say, well, yeah, oh, well, that's, I believe that. There's, there's other passages that say, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Right? Jeremiah tells us that. So, you know, it, it isn't really as simple as, oh, yeah, just believe. Well, believe with your heart. Amen. You see? With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. It's, it's not just head knowledge. So uh, here, of course, it's just kind of simply put. But here's a man in great distress. How do I know? Because he's ready to kill himself. Listen, that's totally against nature to want to kill yourself. You have to be so deeply depressed that you want to kill yourself. This man at this point realizes his career is over. He's going to lose all of these inmates and the and Roman government will exile him to an island. You'd rather be dead. So he figured, I might as well kill myself now. The dishonor he would bring, you know. Uh, oh, put your sword up, Paul said. No, no, nobody's leaving in here, right, fellas? <laughs> <You know. laughs> And they're probably grumbling in the back. I'm wondering if only Paul and Silas are the ones that had the chains off. So, uh, greatest question ever asked, what must I do to be saved? And the greatest answer ever given, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when they heard uh, this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said, Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, this is at Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, I mean, this is a similar question, a great question. What shall we do? 
And he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, all right, so we could go on about this, but it's, and it's glorious. But uh, I want to get to something. Let's see, what is it? 8.14. Ugh. All right, back to uh, reading and exhortation and doctrine. You know, we brought this up before, and I want to highlight this a bit this week. So we have um, we have the pillars of faith. Now you can use the term theology, and that's a good term. Theos is God, and logic, logi, is the study of. So theology is the study of God, and uh, and, and this in its in a in a general sense, what is theology? And I spoke last week of systematic theology. So, so in a sense that uh, the Athanasian Creed was a simplistic systematic theology. The idea was saying, we're putting forth these major doctrines. And we're saying, this is what a Christian believes. If he doesn't believe this, even if he says he's a Christian, he's not a Christian. That, that's what we need to... We're going to need to do this all over again in this generation because people are simple, and, and I say that in a polite way. They're simple. Uh, I think they're willingly ignorant, as how Peter puts it. Willingly ignorant means that they don't bother to look into it very deeply. Uh, so they're superficial. So we might have to get all back to this. Uh, well, we should always know this anyway, but uh, we, need, we need to root and ground people now. Because the devil's plucking up that which has been planted. So, uh, all right. So, if you go to systematic theology, uh, the very first pages will be about the nature of God, and, and then from there, after after the nature of God, which will take up a large portion of your systematic theology, uh, that will be his attributes. That will be his purposes and plans. That will be his. Uh, uh, foreknowledge and so on. All of this is, is a part of the study of theology proper. But then we have these various headings underneath theology that need to be addressed as well. What's God's relationship to man? Anthropology. Now, you can go to college and get anthropology, but uh, you'll never learn about God there or Adam and Eve. I mean, that's all rejected by those folks. We're talking about a biblical anth uh, anthropology. We're talking about ecclesiology, which is the study of the formation of the church. You'll find that fascinating. Uh, and then, of course, uh, hammer theology, which is the study here of uh, uh, sin and all of its terrible nuances. So uh, Catholics believe there's venial sins and mortal sins. Uh, there's certainly a degree of sin. Uh, in the absolute sense, God has no sin. So one could say that any sin to him is a defilement. So, but there's certainly some sins uh, that we might say, sins of omission, for instance, which are not as, as critical as sins of commission, where you know what you're doing and you do it anyway. You're gonna, you know that God doesn't want you to do it and you'll do it anyway, then that's sin of commission. Sins of omission, it was uh, David that wrote in Psalm 19, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me and I shall be upright, and so on. So the uh, presumption that I am right when I'm really wrong. Uh, I'm guilty of that. You're guilty of it. We're all guilty of presumption. And that is, it's good that the blood of Christ cleanses us from things we didn't even know were wrong. So that's all uh, hammer theology. And then, of course, we have eschatology, which is the study of the end times. There's soteriology, the great study of salvation, the process whereby God saves us. Angeology, which is the study of good angels and bad angels. <clears throat> and then pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. And I left out uh, the most critical and most important study of all, which I believe is the foundational truth of the scripture, and that is Christology. The study of Jesus. The study of his life. Uh, and so when you look in systematic theology, you're going to see many different headings under this. Of course, his, his pre-incarnation as the Logos. You're going to see his incarnation, virgin born. Uh, that doctrine comes under Christology. You will see his uh, deity, that he is God in the flesh from the beginning. 
The angel said his name is Emmanuel. This is God with us uh, right from the beginning. But then his impeccability, and his impeccability is his sinless nature. Through all of his life, he does not commit sin against God. He becomes the blameless sacrifice then. Uh, and then you move on, of course, through this, and it's somewhat vitally tied to soteriology, where Jesus becomes the atonement and the covering for our sins. Uh, so, and of course, from there, his uh, crucifixion, his miracles, his teachings. So, I mean... You'll take up most of systematic theology with that. Let, let me run through something real quickly, if you'll let me. I'm not sure if you're interested. Are you interested? Yes. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah. People say, Pastor, we're just so enthralled. I, well, I, it's hard to tell when, with your eyes closed and snoring. But <laughs> All right. Systematic theology. So if you took the... Uh, uh, I, I've told you before, too, probably, if you wanted to get a very basic one, Thiessen's systematic theology is the one for you to buy. I wouldn't tell you to get the first one I ever got, and I have about 20 different systematic theologies, but the first one I ever got was by A.H. Strong. Uh, no cousin or relation to James Strong, the concordance writer. But A.H. Strong was a Baptist minister. He had a church in Ohio, and he wrote in the early 1900s, and he, he compiled this uh, systematic theology. Uh, it's a weighty tome. Um, it's, it's advanced, I would have to say. And, I, uh, and he holds different positions uh, that I don't agree with necessarily. The theistic evolution, for instance, was very popular in the early 1900s. I can forgive him for that. Uh, but there were a lot of things I learned from that, and that was the first one that I got. But then there are others uh, that you can add to your library. But I, Thiessen, uh, I got much later, and I realized this is, a, this is good for, for one reason alone, and that is it is um, easy to follow. Uh, it's, it's thin, okay? <laughs> so it's not a big, thick book, you know, systematic theology, or, or Lewis Berry Schaefer's systematic theology, you know, or Sheds, or uh, all those different ones that there are. This is, this is a, you, can hand, you can have it in one hand. And it's the only systematic theology that I have found that is eschatologically correct. In other words, it's pre-millennial. Uh, so, so I would highly advise that one if you wanted to get one. But what you would do then is open it up. And you would find typically uh, in the uh, chapters, this is just a heading of how it would be organized and give you some idea. Uh, in this case, it starts with the doctrine of the word of God. So uh, that's vitally important, obviously. And, and so then you would go down through the points, the Word of God, the canon of Scripture, how we got the Bible, and so on. The characteristics of Scripture, authority, and so forth. The inerrancy of Scripture, the four characteristics of Scripture, and the four characteristics of Scripture here, you know, clarity and necessity and sufficiency and so on. Uh, then you, you would come maybe to part two here in this particular one, the doctrine of God comes next. The existence of God, the knowability of God, the character of God, incommunicable uh, attributes of God, the character of God, in, uh, communicable attributes, and um, part two of that. And then God in three persons. So now we have a Trinitarian perspective that might be taken up in other theologies by pneumatology, for instance. Um, the creation, God's providence, miracles, uh, the uh, prayers, angels, Satan, and demons. So this is uh, this simplistically kind of uh, put forth uh, in this order. Again, every systematic theology orders their system in a different pattern. It doesn't much matter. as It covers all the topics ultimately and eventually. It's just how what headings they put under it. Um, so then we have the doctrine of man, which is anthropology and the doctrine of man in the image of God, the creation of man. Man is male and female. I guess we really need to study that these days. And then the essential nature of man, uh, sin, you see, so hammer theology is kind of taken under this. Uh, so that's, that's the way that he's covering it. So then we have sin and the covenants between God and man and doctrines of Christ and the Holy Spirit, the person of Christ, the atonement, the resurrection, the ascension, the offices of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine and the application of redemption, uh, common grace, election, reprobation, the gospel call, the effective calling, regeneration, conversion, justification. You writing all this down? And the adoption and so on. 
Well, the reason I want to just run through this real quickly is just to give you some idea and a flavor for it. And perhaps even to pique your interest, you might say, yeah, I think I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to uh, have a study like that and be able to go through it. Oh, years back, uh, some people had actually uh, said they, they wanted uh, me to teach on the, the doctrines. And so I decided uh, we'd have a little Thursday night Bible class and uh, those that wanted to attend. And I mean, I probably had 30 people at that point came to the first meeting. Second meeting, there were about 15 people. Third meeting, it started to taper off pretty rapidly. <laughs> but I, um, I said, okay, we're all going to get the, uh, you know, I believe this is the book you use when you're teaching, okay? But there are such things as helps. And uh, in that case, I said, look, why don't you, everybody get Herbert Lockyer's All the Doctrines in the Bible. It's not really systematic theology proper, but it's an interesting way to look at it, you know. So, uh, so everybody got the book and, and we kind of went through the doctrines. But, I mean, everything Lockyer does is he puts the, the order of these various doctrines and then he gives the scripture to prove these things. And that's what a systematic theology is all about. A.H. Strong, I mean, this is really, I cut my teeth on that because he would give you the, the, the doctrine. This is the doctrine of the triune Godhead. And then he'd, he'd list 50, 60 verses after that. And, uh, and you could run right through it with the scripture and you could see, you know, how this doctrine was woven in the warp and woof of uh, the New and Old Testament. Okay, I, so, so you can go on here, of course, baptism. Now we have uh, almost some ecclesiology involved here. Uh, death and intermediate state, glorification, union with Christ, the doctrine of the church. There's ecclesiology and church government and so on. Uh, the ordinances, baptism, the Lord's Supper, how, how worship, the gifts of the Holy Spirit in general. Uh, this is where you would come uh, with the notions of cessationism or continuationism, you know, where we have this great uh, divide with the uh, modern Christians have really taken up what they believe to be a second Pentecost. Uh, they believe all the gifts are active and so on. So, uh, but you learn all of these uh, perspectives. And, uh, of course, that eschatology, the doctrine of the future, the return of Christ, when and how? When? Well, I'd like to read that. Okay. And then the millennium, the final judgment, the eternal punishment, the new heavens and the new earth. And so that's the way it would be laid out in this particular systematic theology. But there's a lot of other ways uh, that you'd find it. So maybe you'll find it interesting. At any rate, that's certainly what Paul had in mind when he's speaking about doctrine, that you might know doctrine that you would understand doctrine, that would you, you give yourself wholly to it, meditate upon it, he's saying. Uh, so what, uh, what happens then? Then you are rooted and grounded. And then when people come at you with this idea and that idea, and I mean, you, you can tell as soon as you hear some of this, this is wrong. You know, it's bad teaching. Uh, but again, we've got very superficial Christians today. They think it's terrific stuff. They listen to the, oh, that's great, you know, and so on. And I'm thinking, wait, they have no discernment. It, it's really pathetic. Uh, and as a result, they'll be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Every new thing that comes out, you know, they'll move to this one. It, you know, in the 90s, the big deal was amongst the charismatics is the laughing. Uh, people, people were given to laughing, you know. No, oh, they'd start this stuff and, uh, you know, they'd have people on the floor, rolling on the floor, laughing and so forth. And, and I'm thinking, well, where do you see this in the Bible? But you see, their, their doctrine is, well, God gives us new things that aren't in the Bible. See, so extra scriptural revelation. You know, they, the gift of prophecy is still active. God told me that this is the new thing, and this is the new wave. And then they had the gold teeth, remember? They had the gold dust was coming, and people were getting gold teeth and so forth. I mean, I go to the dentist. They, don't, they, they can do it that way, but I mean... It's idiotic, some of the stuff that goes on. We had uh, women howling like uh, animals. Uh, but the Holy Spirit was giving them all this. So you hear them say, well, you know, where are they coming up with this? They invent these things. So it's critical for believers to know what the Bible says and how it says. And, and for that matter, once you've gotten that teaching, you also need, at some point, is to understand the history and to go back and actually see 
the evolution of false doctrine and see where it started and how it started. And you can see it's so clear because, you know, God has afforded to us extant literature that was written. I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about other historical writings by Christians during those eras where we see the struggle that was going on and you can discern immediately between those that were defending the faith and those that were apostate. Um, and I'm hoping everybody here gets to that level. We all want to be mature believers. Don't want to be babies all of our life in diapers and you know so we want to really understand and get deep into the Word of God and and then the devil can't bother you. He really can at that point. I hope that's the case. We're going to the fifth chapter next week. And, uh, you know, it starts with a rebuke, not an elder. So I've got a lot to say about that since I'm an elderly man, right? So, Lord, give us your blessings here. Uh, that's why we come. Uh, hopefully, that's why we're coming on Wednesday nights. We, we want the extra teaching. We, we want to know more. There's, there's more to know. And we want to grow deep and be well grounded. So you'll help us to do that. We know you promised to send us your spirit and he lives in our heart. But it's up to us to be filled with him and to have the knowledge. And we depend on him because Jesus said that there are many things he had to tell us, but it took the spirit of truth to come to reveal it. So reveal to us, Lord, as we read, as we study, as we preach, Lord, help us to be sound in doctrine. Help us to be defenders of the faith in the midst of this onslaught of corruption. Thank you for being our sacrifice uh, Lord, in just a few days, the joy of Christmas will uh, be here. People will be celebrating. And uh, people that don't even know you will celebrate. And uh, perhaps, Lord, it will, it will speak to them at this time. We always hope for this, Lord, that somebody might come into our midst uh, this Sunday and uh, see the program and hopefully, Lord, fall in love with Jesus. And uh, that we can do what we can, Lord, and be a good and positive witness. We learned here last week we have to be good examples. So help us to do just that. In Jesus' name. I invite you to accept Amen. the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thank you.